Look at tonight's session going on what we built last week. We talked about last week, did Yeshua come to do away with, as we're looking at new to Hebrew roots, did he come to do away with the Old Testament? And we come up with the answer, no. Now the last slide for last week's lesson we didn't get to see because I kind of rushed it through and wanted to wrap it up, but I wanted to start with it tonight. So I wanted to start out with this because, you know, it doesn't matter where we start in Scripture. As far as exegeting and studying and looking at this passage right here that you find in Daniel chapter 7, 13 and 14 is one that needs to be preeminent in everything you do when you're looking at Messiah or looking at scriptures. And, and so follow along with me. I didn't put it up there. I want you to look it up. I want you to mark it in your Bible. I want it to become part of who you are because it's so important. Verse 13 says this. This is Daniel speaking. He said, I was looking in the night visions, plural. So he's, he's had more than one. And behold, ha <laughs> exclamation, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of the heavens and he came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. And dominion was given to him, and glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. When we are talking about Yeshua and what he did, this is the physical, corporeal person, Yeshua. Yahweh saves salvation through this one. He is our king. He rules over all the nations. He has not set up his kingdom in Jerusalem yet like he says he's going to. That's part two of the, the saga as far as when he comes. He came the first time as Ben Yosef and now he's going to come again as Ben David to rule and reign on the throne of David. Keep that in your mind as we look through scriptures. Especially when we start looking at the letters that are written in the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament. We've got to remember that these were letters that were written by the apostles to churches or individuals to bring light, to bring instruction, to bring encouragement, to bring better understanding of what was already written. Yeshua has not diminished at all in his authority and who he is. So we need to remember that he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So if we keep that in the premise, the very focal point of everything we do, that should be the lenses of which we look through when we look at Scripture. This is the creator of the universe. Yeshua giving us instruction. So at what point does he do away with it? Well, that's part of what we're going to be looking at tonight. Or getting started with, because when, when I get to a certain section of it, and if you've already cheated and read your notes, you know where I'm going with this. So we know that, that Yeshua didn't do away with Yahweh's instructions, the laws, the prophets, the writings. He said, I came to fulfill them. Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I have come to annul the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to annul, but to fulfill and we went and used scripture to interpret what it meant to be fulfilled because we don't want to just use a word out of the dictionary because that can lead us astray. So we went directly to the word to see what it said. And Yeshua himself defined what it meant 
when he said fulfilled in scriptures. And this is what we found when we went into John. We saw that it didn't mean to come to an end as far as to cease to exist. That, that isn't what it meant. And then I gave this great example. At least I thought it was great. If you have contractors building a house for you and they get it all done and they say, okay, it's all done. It's finished. We fulfilled our contract. It's all done. And you go, okay, I'm never going to move into it. Have you ever heard of anybody doing that? Anybody? Why? Because that's stupid. Right? I mean, think about it. You spend hundreds of thousands of dollars building a nice home and everything's done. They give you the key and you go, eh, I don't think I want to move into it. I don't need it anymore. I still have my little shack. I'm okay. Why do you want to stay in the shack when you can be underneath the tent of Yahweh? Wouldn't you want to be in his graces, under his protection, in his house? You know why they don't want to be there? They don't want to have to follow his rules. Right? My kids all know. As they grew up, I said, hey, while you live in here, you're under my rules. When you leave, you have your rules. But if you come back, guess what? You're coming back underneath my rules because you're in my house. My daughter and son-in-law live right next door to me. Guess what? When they come over to my house, different set of rules. Still my rules. Why? Because it's my house. And when I go next door to Mike and Ia's house, it's their house. He's the patriarch of his family. And I obey his rules. And that's what we're supposed to do. When you're in your father's house, you obey Israel. So nothing's changed. Nothing ceased to exist. And then he said, doing what was required concerning him. He came to do his part. I mean, it, it's really, really quite simple. I mean, I, I put a piece of puzzle up here. All right? If, if, if the word of God was like a puzzle and you had one piece out that said, this is Yeshua, but we're not done painting it yet. As soon as we're done, we're going to put it in place. So Yeshua came to finish the piece so it could be put in place. So now you have the complete thing. See what I'm saying? So he completed the law as far as bringing it to its full fruition. To, it, to its zenith of, 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 zenith of what, what it could be and what it's supposed to be for us. That's what he brought it to so that everything in it we can abide by and follow by underneath the Melchizedek priesthood. And kingship. Because he is both king and priest. Remember we're going to keep that in the back of our mind. He is our king. Right? Now what bothers me about people is this. Marco you, you like to, to do stuff. So why don't you come up here. I need a good strong guy. I want you to stand here. Because if you stand beside me you'll dwarf me. That's okay. Come right up here. I take kneecaps out first. <laughs> Just stand right up here. We're going to role play. We're going to have a little fun. I know you'd be great in key with this because you look like a person that goofs off a lot. Ah! Oh! All right. Dad, just don't turn around because you need to. But right about there. So get a little bit of profile. Yeah, you look so nice. So I have the word of God. I hope you can take it. I'm about to thump you with it. No. <laughs> Depends where you hit me. Okay. I'm going to pretend and he's going to pretend we're at Mount Sinai. And I get to play Yahweh. And I reverently, I, I do so, Father, not in joking, but in illustration. So I have the word that I have just given. And I've given it to Moshe. And as he gives it to Moshe, Moshe reaches out and takes it. These are my instructions. These are yours forever for you to follow. I want you to go and tell the people. So just turn around. Don't really say anything, but just kind of point at him and... There you go. No, no wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait a minute. M Moses, hey, Moses. Yeah. Moses, hey. Um, you don't need this anymore. Jesus came so you can go sit down. They, they, I didn't really mean forever. I just meant for a little bit. Okay, so... You, you can just go sit down. You, it's done. Right? How foolish is that? When God gave man his instructions, he gave them to him forever. Go sit down with that and read it and live by it. Thank you. You can sit down. 
He didn't know he was going to be my illustration this tonight. One. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a heavy book. But isn't that foolish? That's exactly what mankind is saying when they say that the Old Testament or the laws or the prophets are no longer valid to us anymore. They are saying in a rebellious spirit, whether they know it or not, they are shaking their fists at Yahweh and saying, it doesn't apply to me anymore. How many of you right now would take your Bibles and rip the Old Testament out and throw it away? Now you say that in, in even a Christian church and they would look at you and go, oh, that suck religious, you can't do that. But you've already done it in your heart. You've dismissed the whole word of God from Genesis to Malachi. You said it doesn't apply to us anymore. Oh, well, wait a minute. There are a few. I like the Psalms because there's some really good Psalms. In fact, we sing some good songs, right? Psalms of song and praise. And, and then there are some really good Proverbs. I like Ecclesiastes the best. In fact, when, when I was dating my beautiful bride, we were just dating. And I said, here's one of my favorite verses, Ecclesiastes 4.11. <laughs> How can one be warm alone? <laughs> you have to snuggle to get warm. <laughs> That's Lambert paraphrased a little bit. See, there's passages of scriptures that we like, and so we will take them and they go, well, I'm going to make those mine, and the rest of them we don't need. Like the ones that says, you need to do this because I said so. Dietary law. I, I, I know that people say, well, that's been done away with. Well, has it? I, I can't find in Scripture where it has, but what I find is that people don't want to because they like BLTs. They, they like pork roasted in, in, a, in a luau pit, which seemed strange to me. You, you heat up these coals, you throw a dead pig in there, and then you cover it with dirt. If I did that in the kitchen, my mother would kill me. And then you dig it up and eat it. And it's, mmm, this is good. I know that's a method of cooking. But it's just, it's weird that, that we have, most of the time we will find the difficulties that we are engaged in is because we don't want to do something that Yahweh tells us. And so we don't. See, he came to fulfill his part because he wasn't doing away with it. He was making perfect the covenant so that by trusting in him, we have legal rights as heirs to the house of Yahweh. And that's important for us to remember. So I want to glean through some more scriptures as we, we look at tonight's stuff. So if he came to fulfill the scriptures, then the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, must also support the scriptures. Is that right? I mean, everything in, in the New Testament has to support everything that God has already given. But do they? We're going to look at that very closely in the next several weeks. Because the Tanakh, if it is God's word and we're saying it is, if we say it hasn't changed, then every letter that the apostles wrote, every dictation that was ever taken from any of the Brit Hadashah has to line up with the Tanakh or it's a contradiction or a lie or there's some kind of misprint or something there. And it's for us as it says, uh, Paul is saying to Timothy, it, for you to rightly divide the word of truth. And you have to figure it out. So I'm being very strong in my vocalism here because it really is important for us to set the stage. So here are at least 10 of the most commonly referred to scriptures in the Tanakh that are used in the Brit Hadashah. Just to show you how much the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, is relying on the Old Testament. Now these are just 10 there's more. There's Joel and Amos and several other the prophets we didn't even get to. These are just by numbers. Isaiah referred to 419 times in 23 books in the New Testament. <laughs> That's a lot of reference, isn't it? Psalms, 414 times. Oh, but wait a minute. If we did away with that, wh wh why do we need it in the New Testament? It shouldn't even be there. So find them and re erase them. You're going to find out if you do that, you'll only have 50% of your New Testament left. Genesis, 360 times in 21 books of the New Testament. Exodus, 250 times in 19 of the New Testament books. And then you've got Deuteronomy, 
which some people say needs to be thrown out altogether because there's no way that we can listen to any of that, is 208 times in your New Testament in 21 of the books. Are you, are you wowed so far? I mean, I was when I started looking at these. I was like, holy cow. Interesting. Here's the last five. Ezekiel has 141 in 15 books. Daniel 133 times in 17 of the New Testament books. You've got Jeremiah, the lamenting prophet, 125 times. Now, wait a minute. Why would we want him in there? He was the one that was always belly aching and crying, right? He was the one under persecution and remained steadfast. That's why it's important for us to have him in the Brit Hadashah because if you and I are the last remnant when Yeshua is going to come as Ben David, know that there is a period called the Great Tribulation, period. It's called great because nothing's ever matched it before. And you will be going through that. And if you are not set like Jeremiah, you will be like all the others that were false prophets in his day. But he was a suffering prophet. It's mentioned how many times? 125 times is referenced in Jeremiah. Leviticus. Who can even understand Leviticus? I couldn't say it for a long time, much less spell it. Leviticus, and, and then it began to amaze me as I understood that our Jewish brethren take their little four and five year old children and when they start them in school, the first thing they teach them is the book of Leviticus, not John. They teach them Leviticus, why? Because we are still underneath a priesthood of Yeshua. That we are supposed to be a living sacrifice. This is the temple. And we don't teach our kids that anymore. We don't teach modesty. We don't teach truth. We don't teach living separate from the world. We want to look just like them. Let's sign up our kids in all the programs. And then all of a sudden the programs dictate the family's life. Well, we've got soccer on Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday afternoon. I know it's a little bit tough, but, you know. And then, that isn't good enough. We're going to do it for, you know, eight months, but we'll have a summer camp, too. So, you get to do it 12 months out of the year. And so, when you ask them, you're going to come to fellowship this week and, and break bread with us and have a little bit of fellowship time on Friday night? Whoa, I got, I got soccer. I got church. I can't go to church. I've got soccer. So this little round ball, and you're training your kid that that ball and running around with his teammates is more important than coming to the throne of God and meeting and understanding truth and getting fed. But then there's the flip side of the coin, and I'm not even going to go there because it's not nice. Because they go to churches and only get fluff. Oh, it came out anyway. So. Leviticus, 107 times in 15 books. In the Brit Hadashah. I think it's important to know the Tanakh, the Torah, Numbers, 73 times in four of the New Testament books. In four books, 73 times, Numbers is there. And it's not talking about the numbers next to the verse or the chapter numbers. It's talking about the book of Numbers and referencing the truth that are in there. And this is incredible, folks, when we see how tied in it, it, it's like, you know, doctors that are doing very meticulous operation on nerve endings will tell you that it's so difficult when you're working with nerves because nerves have tentacles and fingers that just go everywhere. And if you're trying to work on one specific part, you have to be careful because you could sever any part of that. And the Old Testament, the Tanakh, the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, are intricately entwined together. They do not separate. They don't. They're a chad. They're one. They're God breathed. They're inspired from the Ruach HaKadosh. And they are perpetual commandments, instructions for us to live by every single day. I 
just thought those were interesting, and I want to throw them out to you, because it's very important for us to understand. So how many times does it say we are to follow or keep or obey the Torah, the Tanakh, or Scriptures? How many times does it say? Would you believe 281? And I had someone ask me tonight, oh yeah? Can you prove it? So yes, next week I'm going to print out all 281. So if you want them, you will have them. So you can study by them. There are 281. I have them in print and I will get them to you next week. 281 times it is referred to or a direct commandment to keep the Torah. In other words, you don't have to say, well, it says right here, thou shalt keep the Torah. And, and that's the only verse you need to look at. Implied is equally important, if not more important, i.e., example, is when you see Yeshua's parents observing the feasts and obeying the commandments or the laws or instructions, and you see Yeshua's parents doing it, or you go through any passage of Scripture and you see in someone obey, that is referencing them obeying Scripture. 281 times we will find those kinds of scenarios pointing to the Torah. And, and scriptures of the Old Testament that we're supposed to follow. So I think there, there's, you know, some validity there. Well, I want to read to you Psalm 111, 1 through chapter 12, verse 1. Because listen to what's being said here. Hallelujah. Praise Yah the Father. I will thank Yahweh with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and of the assembly. Where are we supposed to praise Him? Where are we supposed to give praise? In our hearts and in the assembly. It's important for us to come together so we can encourage one another and praise the Father together in assembly. The works of Yahweh are great, sought out by all those desiring them. Whoa. Well, let's think about this verse for a minute. All right. You say you desire God. You say you desire and you love Him. All right, so I can only relate in stories that apply to me because I don't know about anybody else's love life, but I can tell about mine. When I was dating Tina, she was, she still is, <laughs> two years older than I am. She was in college. I was a freshman in high school. I was going to college at night while I was a senior in high school, and that's where I met her. She also was coming to the same fellowship we were. I saw her, and I just kind of went, nice. Yeah, I hadn't seen one looking like that for a while. I mean, she was a cutie. And, you know, I wanted to be just Joel Cool, right? You know? So, Hi, how are you? <laughs> no. She didn't like me. She thought I was arrogant and pushy and snotty. And how dare I pick on the pastor the way I picked on him. My dad was the pastor. He was also the Sunday school teacher for the teen. And his whopping class had one teenager in it. So my dad and I would go in and have Bible study together. It was dad and Gary. And it was the Gary pick on dad show. It was awesome. And my dad and I would patter back and forth and pick on each other. I'd pick on his bald head, pick on his big nose, talk about his four eyes. Now I have them. It just, God is so funny and how he does that. And so she came and sat in the class with some of the other college people. And of course, I wanted to make a good impression. So I really vamped up the sarcasm <laughs> as if that wins somebody over, right? And man, I just laid it out there and man, put my dad under the carpet. <laughs> It was good. I impressed her really well. And then one of the, the families in the church afterwards invited us over to eat with them for lunch. And the college kids were going to go too. Well, you know, I wanted to be there. So we went and we talked and we did fun stuff. And I, I had a cowboy hat. I mean, it was a nice cowboy. I, I just don't look like the cowboy type, do I? No. You ought to see me crack the whip. And so I had this beautiful cowboy hat. At least I thought it was. I looked just like Tim Conway with the apple dumpling gang, right? The cowboy hat. So I, here I am, I'm out there. And, and she took my hat and did the Mexican dance around it and then stepped on it. 
my hat. All of a sudden, I didn't like this girl too much. That was my hat. She stepped on my hat. You don't do that. And I took my hat and I brushed it off and I went and I went across the street. And you know those, those wooden pillars with the guardrail things with the wire going through? I sat on one side. And she came over and sat on the other one and started talking. And we just, first time, our first conversation where we really talked to each other. So I said to her, how do you like pastor's kids? I hate them. I despise them. I've grown up with them. I had a boyfriend that was a preacher's kid and he was awful. <laughs> it's going from worse to impossible. I said, I am a pastor's kid and that was my dad. And she was like, Ugh. she didn't realize that she had just kind of threw up all over me, you know. I had to pursue her. You know why? And it was fun because I chased her until I caught her, but she, she is convinced that she let me chase her and, and stopped and let me catch her. So it, it, it's been a mutual, wonderful experience. But I, I desired to be with her. I desired to know her. She was a fun, lovable person, and she still hasn't changed. She does some of the most incredibly wonderful things that drive me nuts. But they are beautiful things in her own person. And I desire to be with her. And I still do. Sometimes we, we don't even say anything. We just look at each other. And, and, and the other day I said to her, I said, you know, you're almost 60. That's not a good thing to say, guys. You know, <laughs> it didn't go over too well. Um, but I meant it in a way, because I'm looking at her, I'm going, she doesn't look it. You know, in fact, she was out with our grandkids not long ago, and someone said, oh, are those your children? <laughs> no, they're my grandkids. <laughs> what? Yeah. So mama's doing really good, and I'm proud and excited how God has shown favor in her. But I pursued and desired and sought after. Why? Because I, all of a sudden, no one else looked good to me. Sorry. And there's a lot of beautiful women out there. There's a lot of beautiful women when I was growing up, but there was only one that shined. And I hooked her, man. <laughs> and she's mine. <laughs> and praise the Lord. <laughs> Good stuff. This desire, this personal intimacy that is often referred to as the marriage of Yeshua and his bride is the same thing that we should have as we're searching out and desiring to know him, what it says here in the Psalms. So I, I beg to ask you the question, do you feel that way about him? Does just saying his name sometimes bring tears to your eyes? Do you close your eyes and sense that he's standing there putting his arms around you? That the creator of the universe who breathed life into you and you became a living nephesh, this being became a temple that is part of his to worship in and the very breath you take is him breathing in and giving you life. Do you ever sense that? If you don't, you need to spend some time in checking where you're at. Verse 3, his work is honorable and glorious and his righteousness is standing forever. He has made a memorial for his wonders. Wait a minute. He's made a memorial for his wonders. He's made, what is a memorial? Isn't it something that you can touch and see and look at? And remember, we do that in the graveyards. We put a memorial up. We put a tombstone so we can go there and see them. And we write it on stone so that the weather doesn't wipe out their name. So that we can go back 200, 300 years later. And their name is still there so they're not forgotten. God says that he has put a memorial out there for us to be able to remember him. And we read that sometimes and it goes, wow. But Paul caught it. Paul knew it. And he says in Romans chapter 1, he says the universe displays 
His glory and His majesty. Have you ever stopped and picked the leaf off a tree and just started peeling it apart and see all the different little veins that are in the leaf and, and see the intricacies that are inside that little leaf? That's God. And you know how He made that? Oh, there it is. All of creation. Wow. Absolutely phenomenal. He has made a memorial for his wonders. Yahweh is gracious and full of pity. This just tears apart everybody who says that the, the God of the Old Testament is a mean, bad God. He's a God of pity. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of long-suffering. He has given food to those who fear him. He will always remember his covenant. Well, wait a minute. We, we just did a little thing here that, that, that Moses was going to give it back because we have Yeshua. Now we don't need it, right? So he's going to give it back. But he says, I always remember this. I gave it to you. I wrote it. And I'm giving it to you so you will always have it. And he says this, I will always remember it. Do you know what that means? When he said that you are in Yeshua and that through Yahshua, Yahweh's salvation, if you're trusting in Him, there's nothing that can break that covenant that He's made because He's going to remember it. Whew. You can go home. <laughs> what else is there to know that God remembers His covenant for us? So much so that He had His own Son come and fulfill every part that had to be done to make it complete so that we could walk in it. And be a part of it. Wow. Verse 6. He has shown to his people the power of his works. To give to them the inheritance of nations. The works of his hands are true in judgment. All his commandments are true. Well, not all of them. Some of them don't apply to us anymore. Isn't that what the church says? Isn't that what some philosophers say? Isn't that what some theologians say? Well, not all of them. All here doesn't mean all. Just, it just means, you know, the ones that we want. All the ones that I believe in. All the ones that I want. All the ones that make me feel good, yes. But the ones that make me feel bad, no. That isn't what it says here. It says all of them. Every single one of his commandments. And it goes on because that's not the end of the sentence. There's a comma there. Standing firm. So you have covenants that are given that are forever and they stand firm. Like this table right here. Firm. Like this seat. Firm. Taking all however many pounds this bouncing baby boy is. <laughs> it's holding up. Why? Because it's sure. It's able. It's capable. And that's what Yahweh is for us. Standing firm. At least you know Till it wears out, till it gets old, decrepit. Doesn't apply to us anymore. We are a modern generation. We have technology like never before. We have phones without wires. We can talk to people on the other side of the world and see their face at the same time. We don't need God. Those were for then. Now we have better means. We need them even more because his commandments are true and they are firm and they are forever and ever. I would like to put an exclamation there, a point there, but there's, there's more. He says they are done in truth and uprightness. So he even adds a little oof to the end of this. By saying, all of these commandments that I've given to you, they're truth. Thy word is truth. Everything that is here for us is truth. And it's uprightness to lead us into righteousness. Man, that's some good stuff. See why I've had fun studying this? I, you ought to hear me in my office. You guys are getting the easy part. My office gets the hard part. He sent his redemption to his people. <gasps> Oh. 
We just read verses 1 through 8 where it's talking about the commandments. And now he says, I'm going to do something else. I have the commandments, but now I'm sending you redemption. Right there is just kind of an allusion to letting us know that the commandments are not salvation. Salvation is not a book of law or instructions. Never has been, never will be. But our salvation is in Yeshua HaMashiach. So he sent redemption to his people. Ooh, his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom, a good understanding to all those who are practicing them. Well, wait a minute. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. Okay. All right. Yeah, I fear God. Do we really? A good understanding to all those who are, I have to do them. And not just do them, practice them. You know, Dave gets up here. And, and he, he plays his guitar and he worships. If Dave never practiced and he just got up here, what would he sound like? Sound like me the first time I picked up a guitar. Sounds horrible. But he practiced. Well, at least he practiced at the beginning. Now he's good enough he doesn't have to practice anymore, right? Dave will be the first one to tell you that he practiced. And part of his practice is he brings worship into the practice. That he makes sure that even in his practice that he's exemplifying the art of what he's doing. So practice and practice and practice and practice. And when you think you've got the song down, you practice more. You know why? Because you're never going to get perfect at it. Dave, have you ever practiced a song a hundred times and still made a mistake? His head's doing this. This means yes. Yeah, we all do. Many of us have been driving for years and years and years and years and years. And you, you pull up into the middle of the medium and you're going to turn left. And you look and you don't see anybody. And you look over here and then you look over there to pull in. And you look up again and you start turning. Someone's all of a sudden coming. And you realize, well, what you did was you're, you're pulling into an exit. Uh-oh. But you've been driving for years and years and years, and you made a mistake on the road. See, we all make mistakes. We, we all need to practice. When we get in the car, we need to remember the laws. We need to remember both hands on the wheels. We need to remember turning and putting the signals on. I, I love it when my wife's with me. That person didn't put their signal on. And then when she's not in the car, I go, they didn't put their signal on, you know. <laughs> Have you ever done that? Or a person just cuts in front of you, you go, whoa. Why, why did they do that? There's nobody in front of them, nobody behind them. I've got a car that's only 400 yards in front of me, and this car just, whoo, right in front of me. Why? Because he wanted to be there. And then he didn't turn. He slows down. <laughs> then you try to pass him. He speeds up. So you have to practice. Practice. Life is practice. It's a journey. It's not I've arrived. I prayed yesterday. Was that good enough for today? No, I got to pray today too. I need to pray today for tomorrow that I still pray for that day. That can be confusing. We need to practice. We need to be in a mode of always practicing the law, the scriptures, to walk in righteousness. He pr uh, his praise is standing forever. Amen. It doesn't go away. Hallelujah. Blessed is the man who fears Yahweh, delighting. Here we go. Coming right back to delighting greatly in what? Say it to me. Into what? They can't hear you on the camera. His commandments. We're delighting in His commandments. No, they're legalistic. We don't need them anymore. They don't apply to us anymore because we're under grace. We are, we, we, we are exercising faith and, and so we, we don't need them anymore, right? Right here in Psalms, it says, delighting greatly in His commandments. And this is speaking about someone that, that's just the beginning of wisdom. Someone who's just beginning to walk in the faith and trusting in Him. 
So I wanted to spend a little bit more time in, in just backing up what we did last week. Joshua 23, 6 says this, Therefore, be very firm about keeping and doing everything written in the book of the Torah of Moshe and not turning aside from it either to the right or the left. Is there any giving there? No, very firm, this is what we're supposed to do. In Ezekiel 36, 26, and I love this one because they love to cram this one down my throat. In the new covenant. Listen to what it says. <laughs> but they use Jeremiah, this is Ezekiel. And I will also give you a new heart. Yes, I have a new heart. And I will put a new spirit within you. Amen. He puts in me a new spirit. The spirit of who I am is not a nice guy when he's lost. But the new Gary, he's pretty good. You know why? Because he doesn't want to embarrass or make shame his father's name. I bear the name of Yahweh in my temple. And so I'm going to carry myself that way. I want to represent him the way he wants me to, to represent. So if I've made a mistake or I've done something wrong, I'm going to confess it. And if I've done it in public, I'm going to do it in public. And you have heard me apologize before because I've misquoted or done something and, and who knows. We have a new spirit within us and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. He gives us a new heart. And you know what the heart is in the Bible? Mind. He takes this stubborn rebellious, sin-pointing mind. And he starts to make it a heart of flesh that's soft, moldable by him, and starting to follow in his direction. And the Spirit guides us through his word that changes the mindset and how we think and then how we act. You can see a cross-reference here in Jeremiah 31. Verse 36, verse 27 says this, And I will put my spirit with you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. They don't like reading that verse. Verse 36, uh, chapter 36, verse 37. Look at it closely. What it says. And I will put my spirit with you and cause you to walk in my statutes. His spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. What did Yeshua say? He says, I'm, I'm sending my spirit to paraclete with you. To come up alongside of you. To be yoked with him so that you can what? Walk in his statutes. His commandments. His instructions. So that we keep his judgments. See, they leave that out. They just say, he's given me a new heart. I think different. And I, I have all this, you know, that I can, I can do and, and it's fine, you know, because uh, everything is abstract in the New Testament and it's all just kind of like, you know, faith, oh, holiness. Oh. We ask a person what holiness means and they go, it, it means um, uh, holy. Well, what does it mean? Oh, it's it's. Holy, you know, you know, holy. It, it's hard to explain, Pastor Gary. It's just, it's, 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 a, a, it's way down, Gary. You know, it's holy. No, it isn't. Holy is this. I'm no longer in the flesh. I no longer have a heart of stone. I'm going to step over here where Yahweh is. And so I have been separated from the world into what Yeshua wants me to be. Holiness is set apart. That's all it is. So when we sing, holy, 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 it's the Lord God Almighty. And, and, and most of the time in our minds, we, we're thinking, oh, that word, oh, and we get all emotional about it. And I'm, I'm wondering, how many people realize, I'm setting myself apart, I'm setting myself apart, I'm setting myself apart, because you are set apart. No, I just thought it was a good feeling I was having there for a moment. You just ruined that song for me. Thank you very much. But that's what holiness is, being set apart unto him. And he says, by being set apart in him, now I'm going to what? Just do whatever I want? Still look like the world? Act like the world? Do everything the world does? Including doing dumb things to our body, the temple? By one, parading around immodest? 
putting marks on your body that shouldn't be there and, and say, God knows my heart and this is my testimony. And the world looks at it and says, ah, nice quote. I have one from, from uh, Buddha that's almost as good as that. See, they don't see the difference. You've marked the temple. You've defaced it. What would happen if I came out here at this building and I decided, ah, here's a good idea. I'm going to put a scripture right on the side of this building and, and spray paint it on. What's the owner going to do to me? I'm sorry, officer. I didn't know. I thought I was being a witness. See, we do things without thinking. We do things without really examining God's word. Is this what he wants me to do? I bear the mark of the cross of Yeshua HaMashiach, the tree that he died on. That's what I bear. That stake that he carried, that's what I'm supposed to be carrying. That's what sets me apart. That's what people are going to recognize. Not that I look just like them. Well, you know, Paul said, we'll get to that. And I know Paul said, I've become all things to all people that I might win them. I don't think he became a prostitute so he could win prostitute. He didn't become a drunkard so he could win the drunkard. Come on, that's not what that's saying. You've got to examine scripture to see what it's saying there. And think about what you're saying when you think Paul said something that he didn't say. All right, I got on a preaching ramp on oh. I'm excited about this. So the, these are, see, these are principles and truths that we have to understand that we are to walk in Scripture. And the Scriptures are the Torah, the teachings of the prophets. They are the writings. They are the Brit Hadashah. If we are walking in those as one Echad book that is intricately put together, we're walking in the light of Yahweh. And there's no better place to be. And you will be a set apart people if you do that. Trust me. I mean, you don't even have to do half, quarter, one-tenth of what it says to do. And all of a sudden the world goes, huh? You do what? You want what day off? What's that for? Really? Wow. Okay. So we've established quite strongly, or at least I've been strongly about it, that Yahweh's instructions, His teachings, His judgments, His statutes are to be adhered to and observed. Yes? Yes. Okay. Again, we got to remember that this is not our salvation. This is not about our salvation. Obeying His instructions have nothing to do about salvation. Okay? This has to do with me being obedient to Him after I've been saved. All right? I've been adopted. Now I live like the Father wants me to. I'm now married. I now live by the marital laws. Okay? That's... The, the salvation is a separate issue. We are talking about walking in his statutes and following them. And, and how important that is. Now, but as a result of our salvation, our desires become one to follow after Yahweh. At least it should and I hope it does. There's a lot of stuff on there. Next week we will start in Acts. But you can read through that other stuff. It's just um, the... There's 36 different passages of scripture that are there that people have said. And then you saw what people say about those verses. As far as how they use that to say that the law doesn't apply. We're going to look at each one of those. Each one of them. So I find it almost unfathomable that you would take uh, 37 verses. And actually the, there's only 36. But the guy who wrote the article and put these up uh, had 37. So I kept it up there. So if anybody look, they look under the 37, but he only lists 36. And there may be others too, but these are the primary ones. And so as we look at those, we're going to look at those directly as what, what Yahweh has to say. Because here's the conflict. Here's, and we're going to start out with definitions, because we're going to have to have definitions before we get into understanding these. Is if, if Yahweh's word is true, if scripture, the Torah, the writings, and the prophets are true, and we saw how many times they are repeated in the Brit Hadashah, then there can't be any contradictions. Let me say that again. There cannot be any contradictions. Just in case you missed it, there's no contradictions. Okay? Now, where there may seem to be a contradiction, there's just one of several things happening. One is either an error because of translation or whatever, or the way we're interpreting it, 
and it's a misunderstanding, or two, the Bible is a liar. I'm going to opt with one. Somewhere along the line, somebody made a mistake in the way they translated or understand the truth. Just like a few moments ago when we were talking about holiness, right? Holiness, most people think, is that feeling that starts up and you start singing holy, 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 and all of a sudden you're swaying back and forth and you're, you, you're caught up into it and you say, oh. when it all, all it really means is, I'm over here, guys. I've been set apart. I'm not of the world anymore. I live in it, but I'm not a part of it. I'm not of the world system. See, I don't care if I'm rich or poor. I don't care if I ate eggs tonight or if I had steak. I don't care if my car muffler's falling off and I'm riding down the street, sparks are flying everywhere, or if I'm riding a gold BMW. I don't care. I, I, I don't care. I, I don't care if, if, and my wife hates this, but I don't care what I look like when I dress up. That's why she dresses me. Because I might have polka dot shirt and striped pants, and I, you know, as long as I got clothes on, I don't care. I would have clown shoes on. As long as I have shoes on, I don't care. But she does. You see, this world doesn't matter. You know, I, I, I tried trimming my beard. I, I didn't go to a barber to have it done and do it myself, and I don't do a good job, but I don't care. I don't, I don't see it. <laughs> you have to look at it. Right? When I shaved my head, did it bother me? No, I don't care. You know why? I don't have to look at it. It's not important. Those are the things the world looks at. How well you look. Now, it's important to smell good. I think that's, you know. <laughs> I'll put a line there somewhere. So, showers, guys. Brush the teeth. Let's stand and close in prayer.